All right, what's up? Welcome, you guys. Hopefully, you enjoy, uh, enjoyed my experiment. That was an experiment in... Uh, where's the window capture? There we go. Thank you. Hot coffee. Hot piping coffee with a little TLT from Jamie. Time, love, and tenderness. When love puts you through the fire, when love puts you to the test, nothing heals a broken heart like time, love, and tenderness. Little TLT. Before there was Eat, Pray, Love, there was TLT. Your mom was, was rocking down to that mom core Michael Bolton stuff back in the day. Time, love, and tenderness. And now look how far we've come. MK Ultra mind controlled synthesizer songs where I'm doing stock footage experiments. So yeah, so I thought it would be funny uh, when I was listening to that song to tell a story with stock footage. So that's what I was trying to do. And yes, somebody said your video looks influenced by Gesafferstein. Uh, yes, it was. It was very similar to the Gesafferstein video. So I was wondering if anybody would pick that up that the, uh, the weird zooming in and out. I think that provides a really, uh, I don't know, odd aesthetic. So, yeah. So I was just playing around, just being silly. And yes, I included layers and levels of symbolism. So I think everybody can figure out that the girl is chosen to be part of an MK Ultra assassin ring. And she's roped in by the other girls. And then she is mind controlled. And she goes to... Uh, an institute and then ends up at some weird country estate uh, and her psyche is split yeah so that's that's really all there was to that video but um, I was like wondering why the, I hadn't seen many techno videos with the idea of mind controlled uh, assassins and you know this kind of stuff so listening to that song that's the that's what I was seeing in my mind was something like that and then I thought, well, you know, people make all these stock footage videos and they just kind of go into the void. And I was like, wouldn't it be weird to tell a story from the stock footage dimension? Because stock footage itself is so kind of cheap uh, in the sense of just free. It's out there. It's corporate and it's kind of like, it doesn't have a story to it. It's like the most non-story footage but what if you try to tell a story anyway i was just playing around so experimenting all right as you guys know yes we're going to be talking about uh, i forgot my quran hold on so i, I think you know after <clears throat> not many years of debating muslims uh, but after a few years, we've done, been doing this off and on for uh, three or four years, um, you know, hearing lots and lots of debates, having done now at least four or five uh, public debates with prominent, reasonably prominent uh, Muslims, I started noticing commonalities. Um, and then I thought, well, there are some interesting commonalities when it comes to the issues of uh, continuity and really that for me is the big issue when we want to understand what's the big issue between Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Protestantism uh, it's a question of continuity because everybody in this sphere agrees uh, for this for this moment we're going to set aside the Roman Catholics by the way uh, we'll get to Roman Catholic issues later but for right now we're going to look at the religions of the book, or at least the religions that don't have uh, the focus to be something holistic, but the focus is primarily the book. And that's going to be Judaism, uh, Islam, and Protestantism. So there's commonalities there in those three. And after many, many years of interacting with these different systems, I think I've discovered kind of a, a unique angle that most people don't go down when it comes to this argument as to who's in continuity. And that's what we're going to look at tonight because you'll notice because Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Abrahamic faiths, we're all quote Abrahamic faiths. So, but are we? And 
who is fundamentally part of the Abrahamic tradition will be a big determiner of who's in continuity with the Old Testament. But guess what? Not just the Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant. Who's in actual continuity with the Mosaic covenant? And then not just that, but the Davidic covenant and then the covenant, or the, excuse me, the promises and, and prophecies in Isaiah uh, and Ezekiel and in the minor prophets. Because guess what? There's also a lot of promises as to things that we will see in the Messianic era or in the uh, uh, era in which the fulfillment comes about that's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the Law and the Prophets. And hinging it on this question, because that's what I've noticed that it always comes down to, is so crucial because if you are not in continuity with Abraham and Moses, then you're not the true religion. And if we know the New Testament very well, then we know that a lot of the debates that Jesus has, for example, in the book of John, are primarily about are you in continuity with what came before? Because we have these promises, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, anybody that comes along in the future as a prophet, as a revealer of dreams, mystical omens, etc., uh, prophetic warnings, predictions, all of those, there's one stipulation from Deuteronomy 13 that's repeated in Deuteronomy 18, and that is that they have to teach in line with what came before. You can't have a new thing out of accord with what came before. So the big issue between Judaism, Islam, and I'm going to throw Protestantism in here is, are you actually in continuity with the Old Testament, with what came before? Because it's my contention, and it is the Orthodox contention, that there is no such thing as the Abrahamic faiths. From the vantage points of, of those religions, they see themselves as inheritors of the Abrahamic tradition. But according to Paul in Galatians, there's only one way to be the seed of Abraham, and that is Christ. So without Christ, you're not the seed of Abraham. And you're not the seed of Abraham uh, just because you say, well, we honor Abraham, right? And we're going to see that there's some uh, crucial elements that Islam has discarded which biblical revelation speaks of as eternal, everlasting, and necessary. So this is going to be a kind of a surprise argument. And you might have heard me bring this up in a few of the debates with the Muslims. It didn't come up in every debate, but uh, it seems like it came up in maybe two or three. And let's start with Islam because, you know, in my experience with these debates, and I'm not an expert on Islam, I've not debated every Muslim, um, everybody says debate so-and-so, and 90% and of the time it's somebody that we've already asked or actually debated. So uh, you don't have to remind me of all the various Muslim apologists, I know who they are and all that. And it's not really a question of uh, are we willing to do it, it's just that, you know, after a while it's sort of like we've reached out to all these people and we didn't get much after the four or five debates we did. Nobody seems to want to do it anymore. So what is then the key issue that I noticed over and over and over in all these Islamic debates? It's not just a lack of knowledge uh, of the Bible or the text. It's a fundamental, just sort of like no idea what's going on in the Old Testament. And on the one hand, I understand that Muslims will say, well, we go to the Quran because the Bible was corrupted and we don't trust those texts, but we do trust the Quran. However, as we have pointed out many, many times in many, many debates, the Quran says that it is not corrupt, that the uh, biblical texts are not corrupted. For example, I can barely see this. I can't see what my notes say. Surah 3, I think it is. Surah 3, God, there is no God, but he, the living God, the self-subsisting, he sent down the book in truth. Confirming what was before, he sent down the truth, the, the Torah and the gospel. Okay, 
So God sent the Torah of the gospel. And then we have again in Surah 10, uh, 37, the Quran could not be fabricated. Rather, it is a confirmation of all that came before, of what came before, an elaboration of the book in which there are no doubts from the Lord of the worlds. I'm talking about the Torah. Okay. Now, there's more. I think there's another one. There's another one. Uh, let's see. There's one more I'm missing where it says that the gospel is not corrupted. If somebody remembers this one in the chat, put it in the chat. If Kai, if you're around, you could put that in the chat. I always forget. I thought I had all these marked, but there's at least three statements. Uh, if you look at Sam Shamoon's debate with Shabir Ali from a long time ago, uh, the one I'm trying to think of is like the first one, right? Um, where are we deleting comments? What's going on? Is it Surah 547? Let's see if that's it. I might have missed uh, marking one of them. I still can't see. Five. This doesn't... This is ridiculous. Okay, five. here we go. 547. Let's see if that's it. Oh, yeah, I think this is it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. I forgot I forgot to mark this one for some reason. Let me make a note. Yeah, so, uh, there's a link. Oh, no, it says excellent connection. Let's see. God has sent down the book of truth, confirming the book that came before it. Yeah, so the original book. We sent Jesus confirming the Torah. We gave him the gospel. What's with the F's? Um, it doesn't show that it's cut out. Is it just buffering? Yeah, so uh, it's not me. It's just the uh, connection is in and out today. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Maybe I can. Let's see. Yeah, so it's dropping from zero to 1,000 kilobytes a second, which is ridiculous because I pay the highest price for the highest upload speed. So. I mean, I, I, pray, I paid excessive amounts for this stuff, and so it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> the Saudis are coming after me because of this live stream. No, it's just uh, Spectrum Internet, dude. That's all it is. It's like they're... Uh, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, if it's going to do this. So I guess we could give it a second and see if it irons out a little bit. Okay. So it's going back to normal, but then it'll like, when this does this, it usually will drop back down to zero. 
so I'm getting the highest possible, 17,000 kilobytes per second, and then it drops down to three. This is so ridiculous. I hate it when it does this. It looks like it's getting higher now, so um, if it stays above 3,000, 2,000, I should be able to do it. Okay, so maybe it's doing a little better now. Oh my, my. Happiness. Remember the verb? Whatever happened to the verb? All right, are we good? You guys hear me? Everything good? I don't want to sit here and do this whole thing if it's going to like drop down to zero. You know what I mean? It's, it's not, it's not, it, I'd rather uh, record, I'd be better to pre record something than to. Is it, it looks like it's going all right now. We're getting 5,000 consistently. That's enough to do it. Oh my, my. Okay, so we'll watch that uh, and see. Continue forward as if we can do it. So remember, you know, fundamental to the idea of the structure of the Bible from the Christian perspective. But if you guys hit like and share, please. Let's look at the notion of continuity. Okay, so continuity between the covenants is conceived of in terms of uh, one after another building on one another, right? So in other words, the uh, Noahic covenant builds on the Adamic covenant. And it's fundamental to, I think, biblical theology. I don't know what Islam's view of covenants is, but uh, in terms of Christianity and Judaism, there's the conception that God relates to man uh, through covenantal relationships. And these are uh, covenants that are dual, they're, they're binary, two parties, but God is the one who initiates the covenants, right? It's not, it's not usually a man initiating it and God being like, oh, okay. God initiates the covenant, right, with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David. And these covenants build on one another and they have unique theological elements, angles, uh, expansions, so expansion pack covenants, you could say, <laughs> that go along with each covenant. So from the Orthodox Christian perspective, it is, it is uh, so clearly a, a, a line of continuity that it's very bizarre for us to conceive of the Islamic conception of uh, a, a line of prophets, but where in all of this is the temple, its priesthood, its altar, its sacrifice, and its ministry, right? So for us, <clears throat> there's no way for us to make sense of or explain what Jesus is doing what the New Testament is all about without all of those elements that come out of the Mosaic Covenant. Literally. I mean, it's just so fundamental to even the New Testament theology. Let's take, for example, the book of John, where it says Jesus is the Lamb of God. How could we conceive of this idea without Passover? It makes no sense, right? So the Exodus narrative, Passover, just in that line, behold the Lamb of God that John the Baptist says, is contained this whole idea of the Passover. So it would make no sense to stress discontinuity or to toss out the Old Testament or to think that the Levitical priesthood, the altar of sacrifice, the ministry of the temple which, by the way, the temple is not just this temporary thing where, okay, so there's a temple and then uh, it just goes away at some point. Oh, we don't need that anymore, right? Babylonians come and they destroy the temple. Romans come and destroy the temple in 70 AD. Oh, we don't need that anymore, right? That was done away with. And, and I'm not meaning to be rude to people who are uh, Muslims or whatever, but it's so fundamentally based around an ignorance of what's in the Old Testament that I can't conceive how people think that they could say they're in continuity with the prophets when a gigantic portion of the Old Testament, of the Torah, is about the Levitical ministry. It makes no sense at all. I mean, it's like they had no idea what was going on with the temple and this stuff. And 
if you're going to say that, oh, the Jews made up the temple and its ministry, that's crazy. Because this, this is a gigantic chunk. the Almost the entirety of the book of Leviticus. So that's just made up? It's a corruption? By the way, the Quran, as we just saw, does not say that it's full of... I mean, imagine, say, uh, if you think about Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Numbers, okay, and Exodus, gigantic portions of this are Levitical law, rules, Mosaic, administration, temple, uh, ser tabernacle ceremonies. Imagine thinking that that was a corruption of Pharisees or whoever. So in other words, what? 70% of the Torah? So basically we'll take Genesis elements of the first few chapters of Exodus. Um, and that's about it. So that's what? 25%? 30? So 70% is what corrupted made up stuff? And on top of that, how ridiculous when a gigantic portion of the Quran early on is all of these weird rules that are obviously very similar to the types of ceremonial rules that you would get in Leviticus. Okay, so first of all, it makes no sense to say that you're in continuity with these books. We'll say the five books of the Torah first. When about 70% of that is stuff that you're not in continuity with and or you say is made up or a corruption. So let's say Torah. We'll say that first. We're going to guesstimate at about 70% is about, uh, we'll call it rituals relating to the temple, tabernacle, and its administration. Okay, so let's start with that. So we got the Torah. We're going to say about 70% of that. Now, when we come to the other books, let's say the let's take the historical books of the Bible in the Old Testament. Let's say, uh, you know, Judges, uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, Kings. Um, we'll say the Psalms as well. The historical books. Well, the Psalms are not historical books. Those are liturgical worship books. Let, let's say the historical books. Okay. Now, the Quran cites the historical books, uh, not explicitly extensively that I've read, but like it, it summarizes entire sections that come up in the historical text, right? Like uh, David, uh, you know, going and fighting so-and-so, the Ark doing uh, this story here and there. Okay, but a big portion also of the historical books revolves around incidents relating to the worship of Israel, the Ark. Okay, this is like, Huge portions of the of first Samuel, right? Where where does Samuel go? As a child, he is sent to learn in the temple. To learn what? <laughs> to learn the administration, okay? Right? Okay, so the historical books. Now it's true that uh Joshua and Judges, uh, there's not a lot to do with Temple and Tabernacle yet because this is prior to Temple, temple and Tabernacle uh, because it has to be established in the, uh, Jerusalem and J Judges and Joshua are about conquering the land, which they don't actually conquer the whole land yet in Joshua, right? There's still some cities left. And then in Judges, we know it's the time of the Judges before the Kings, so we aren't yet to the point where we've built, uh, we have a movable tabernacle, but we don't have the temple yet. So we're going to say, uh, let's see, the historical text, let's say about, we'll say 50% in some way of the historical text relate to, in some way, stories about temple, tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant, priesthood, Levites, feast days, okay? We'll say about 50%. So the historical books are got about 50%, okay? Because there's other stories that don't directly relate to that. But as I was I was rereading uh, Samuel this last couple of weeks and I finished with 1 Samuel, uh, I noticed, you know, 
the stories of David's life, obviously a lot of them are, are parallel in Christ, right? And this is another thing that we're going to get to in a minute about typology. Typology is a, is a crucial thing to this whole question of continuity. But, I mean, just think of the stories of David going and eating the showbread. Uh, the showbread relates to the temple. So you see what I'm getting at here, right? Not every story, uh, but we're going to say about 50%, because when Saul kills the priests... That relates to the temple. Okay. So let's look at next is Psalms. All right. So Psalms, we've got David's liturgical worship. Where are the Psalms supposed to be sung? Where do you think this? Well, we know in Chronicles what this is all about. This is made for the temple. So this is the liturgical worship services of the temple. So in one way, all of the Psalms also relate to the temple, but not directly. Certainly not every single psalm is about the temple. Many of the psalms are about David's own life, his persecution. And we know the persecution of David is a type of the persecution of Christ. David often records his descent into Hades and his resurrection vindication by God. Those are all also types of the life and ministry of Christ, death, burial, resurrection. So I think we could say, to be fair, uh, I'd say 50 to 75 percent of the Psalms in some way relate to the temple or its worship service or its administrations. Uh, next, let's move to the other section. Um, well, we could say the other wisdom texts. Um, some of the wisdom texts relate to the temple, but not that many because they're not mainly about the worship of God. Uh, so here we're talking about Proverbs, Sirach, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, right? These books. Okay, some of these books, but not that many. We'll say maybe 20, 30% of the wisdom texts relate to the temple. So not, not a huge portion here. But we do want to include it because it is part of the Old Testament. All right, so let's get to next to the uh, prophets, major and minor prophets. Now, if we think about this, it still is difficult to conceive of this being um, something disconnected from the temple and the tabernacle. And remember, we can't rely on this weird argument that the Jews corrupted all the texts and added references to temple, temple and tabernacle. I mean, this makes no sense, right? So let's say, uh, let's think of our major prophets. Uh, if we think about Isaiah, Isaiah has a lot of prophecies that relate to feast days. And in the messianic prophecies of Isaiah, he talks quite a bit about the messianic era. And those are quite often connected to Mount Zion, the temple, the law, and its administration and its worship. Now, one of the key texts that's going to be important for today's talk will be the latter chapters of Isaiah, where he predicts Gentile priests. Interesting. How could there be Gentile priests ministering to God's flock? It doesn't even seem possible. And yet we have that. So, um, we have the prophecy in Jeremiah that the Ark of the Covenant will go away. Now, a Muslim, I could take that and say, ha ha, you see, the Ark of the Covenant will go away. But we're also told that the Ark is everlasting in other texts. So how can the Ark of the Covenant go away and be everlasting? Interesting. Seems like a contradiction. Or there's another way to reconcile these texts, which I will argue obviously points to orthodoxy. So uh, prophets... Two classifications, as you guys probably know, major prophets, minor prophets, minor prophets, smaller books, right? Uh, Hosea, Amos, Zechariah, Obadiah, Habakkuk, Nahum, etc. Minor prophets, major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, <clears throat> Ezekiel. Let's think about Ezekiel. Okay, Ezekiel's prophecies uh, are, a lot of them early on are about uh, uh the sins of Israel, obviously, uh, we talked a lot about the uh, in Ezekiel 1 up to Ezekiel 10. We have the references to the Trinity uh, all the time. We have the references to uh, one like the Son of Man who rides the chariot. That is the Logos himself before pre-incarnate. <clears throat> but then when we get into uh, middle Ezekiel chapters, those are about uh, judgments on Babylon. <clears throat> and then when we get to the end, what do we have at the end? Interesting. We have predictions of a temple and elaborate references to its, its administration. So what are we going to say here? That 30, 40% of Ezekiel is 
I mean, if you looked at all the texts, right? What? Corrupted? Made up? Because we have predictions, for example, in uh, the Dry Bones chapters about the resurrecting of the land of Israel. Ooh, so you see that's right back to the temple and its administration. The latter chapters of Ezekiel deal with a new temple where we have seemingly uh, impossible things. A door where the Messiah enters and yet the door never opens. It stays shut, right? Ezekiel 44. These odd statements of the design and so forth. Uh, statements where the nations are healed from the trees in this new Jerusalem. What is all this about if the Old Testament temple, priesthood, altar, sacrificed, administration, etc. doesn't matter or God has forgotten this or it was tangential? It doesn't know. So we're going to look at some key texts. But I would say, uh, to be fair about you know, if we were to take the whole scope of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, what would we say here? I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe 40%, 30 to 40% in some way relate to uh, the temple and its administration. So let's review here what we have from our Old Testament. And by the way, if we, if we were to think about the minor prophets too, right? I mean, essentially the whole book of Zechariah the whole book, almost every chapter, relates to describing the Messianic era with the imagery of temple, tabernacle, sacrificed, priesthood, incense, altar, etc. Now, don't forget the book of Revelation, because guess what? <laughs> it's worded and uses all the same imagery of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah. You cannot understand the book of Revelations without understanding in depth Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, especially Zechariah. In fact, you could argue that Zechariah might be the most, the book that's the most parallel to the book of Revelations in the Old Testament. So let's review this real quick because this is very crucial to our argument. In the Torah proper, we could say about 70% will relate to, in some way, the temple, its altar, priesthood, its administration, etc. And again, remember, when we say the temple administration, we're talking about the whole of it. We're talking about the showbread, okay? The blessed bread, I wonder what that's about. I wonder what that's a type of. We're talking about the lampstand, which becomes the menorah, which becomes what's on every Orthodox altar, in our view, Okay? We are talking about the imagery. Remember, this is a holistic thing. The temple had all kinds of beautiful imagery, carved palm trees, angels, all this stuff. Okay. Iconography, right? Again, so we're going to say about 70% of the Torah. We're going to say historical books, roughly 50% in some way relating to maybe less, maybe 40%, right? And then uh, we've got Psalms, we're going to say 50%. Wisdom text, not that much, maybe 20, 30%. Prophets, 30 to 40%. So, again, Torah, gigantic portion. What did we explicitly say? see the Quran saying about the Torah? It was not corrupted, it was given by God. Now, this is another point to keep in mind. There are plenty of texts in terms of textual studies for centuries before Islam, right? We don't have to go through medieval monks in the 1300s to get to what Bible church fathers are using, right? So we'll say 6th, 7th century rise of Islam. Don't you think that there are gigantic portions up here? See all this? All of this? These church fathers, these two rows of 40 volumes of church fathers, 38 volumes of church fathers. Okay, 95% of that is prior to Islam. So in other words, let's set aside the actual textual manuscripts. We could reconstruct the text of the Bible, probably all of it or most of it, just from writings of the church fathers quoting the Bible prior to Islam. That's not the only source 
of the text, okay? But church fathers recording things is one way that we go and validate text and compare text. There's also actual text, various manuscript traditions. I'm not arguing about inspiration or anything. That, we're setting that aside for the moment. We're just looking at basic points about uh, prior existing texts versus what Islam today now claims. Not what the Quran claims, but what does Islam now claim in their apologetics, right? Almost all of them run to Bart Ehrman and they run to all the liberal textual higher critics, which is against the Quran. Okay. If the corrupted text stuff was true, why was nobody saying this at that time? Why was the Quran saying the opposite of that? And again, it's not up in the air like we don't know. There are copies of the texts, New Testament, LXX, Septuagint, Masoretic. Th these are all prior to Islam. It's not like we don't know <laughs> what the text said. Right? Do you see that this is not a rocket science point? This is kind of a simple point here. So the the corrupted text argument falls apart because Christianity and Judaism have texts older than Islam that are authentic, that can be verified. That's what I'm trying to say here. And so it should be really transparent that the very recent argument of a lot of Muslim apologists <clears throat> to claim that the Bible is a corrupted text is that a recent argument. It is not the argument of the Quran itself. And the texts of the New Testament and the law are older than the Quran. Do, you, do we not understand this? And so it, it's missing the whole point when we talk about continuity with the text. The whole question between the, these religions is who's in continuity with the actual text? That's it. <clears throat> and today we're talking primarily, as we said, about <clears throat> Islam, Judaism, and Protestantism. And we're going to notice what I think is the strongest argument uh, to settle the issue, to show that Orthodox Christianity, and we're going to look at Rome in a minute, the problems there, because there's a unique point I want to make about the Roman Catholics, why they don't really work here. But we're setting this aside because there's we're going to see some elements that are missing. The Orthodox Christianity has that definitively, I think, proves continuity that these three are missing. And the fact that they're missing these key elements is itself the crucial argument to disprove Islam, Judaism, and Protestantism. And what do, what do we begin to notice as the, the commonality between those three? The book. The book. The religion of the book. Now, what do we mean by that? Because <clears throat> obviously we have the Orthodox Study Bible. We have the book. But there's a big difference between uh, what Protestants, Jews, and Muslims say, at, at mean what they mean by people of the book versus the way we would say, yeah, okay, we're people of the book. But for us, it's not primarily a book, right? It's the incarnate logos that the book talks about, that's the focus of the religion, not the book, okay? The Old Testament, the focus was the book. The fulfillment, in our view, is the book pointing to Jesus. So we don't go back to the book when the book was pointing to Jesus. You see the difference there? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't say the Bible is the Word of God, these kinds of things, because it is. Because the Bible is a revelation of the personal logos, okay? It's not a perfectly inspired physical text. We don't believe that. Why is that? Because we don't possess any original text. Nobody has what Moses wrote. Nobody has what Paul wrote. What we have is copies of those things over various centuries, and there's a huge amount of unanimity between those copies. That's one of the things that we always point out, which is a great attestation to the veracity of the text, that unlike any other text in history, especially that far back, that old, Right? The New Testament, for example, has the greatest amount of veracity amongst textual variants that versus any other ancient text at all. It blows it away, right? Uh, compared to Plato, uh, compared to Aristotle, compared to, you know, old, uh, you know, Gilgamesh epic or whatever, right? 
So those are, those are things to keep in mind, which relate to this topic, but they're not the main issue. So what's the main issue that we're getting at here? Okay. So as we saw from our list there, uh, how is it going to at all make any sense to say that you're in continuity with this book when so much of this book is about things that you're not in continuity with? Now, we just gave one example of percentages that I'm just kind of guessing loosely about, but let's look at some other things, some other uh, important arguments here. <clears throat> let's go back to Genesis 14, because this is a crucial argument made by Paul in Hebrews, assuming Hebrews was written by Paul. Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now, if you don't know about Melchizedek, we make a big point of this because in the Orthodox view, he's not uh, a made up person. He's not Jesus. He's a real guy. He's a saint and he's painted as his own icon and so forth. So we know he's not Jesus, but he's a type of Jesus, but he's a type of Jesus in a unique way. Let's see. King of Salem, by the way, that's Jerusalem. So this is prefiguring the religion that will be in Jerusalem way ahead of time, right? Because we're at Abraham's day. This is before the Exodus, before the conquering of Jerusalem, before Joshua and all that. <clears throat> but Melchizedek is a king of Salem. This is the same place, Jerusalem. And what does he bring out? Bread and wine. Well, I wonder what that is an image of. I wonder what? A priest of God. So this key argument from Hebrews, this is before Levitical priesthood. Aaron does not exist yet. Aaron is in the loins of his father, Abraham. He doesn't exist yet. Aaron is where we get the Levitical Aaronic priesthood. Aaron doesn't exist yet. And yet, who does Abraham submit to, give obeisance to, tithe to, in an act of deference to? Melchizedek. This is the very argument that Hebrews makes. Blessed be, and then, and then he gets a blessing from Abraham, I mean, excuse me, from Melchizedek. <clears throat> blessed be Abraham, God uh, of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high who has delivered you, your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave a tithe of all of his gifts to Melchizedek. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> key, uh, key point here in this text is to note, again, we have before the Aaronic priesthood, before Moses even exists, the giving or, or uh, an already existing priesthood the priesthood of melchizedek this mysterious figure which we don't see much about him other than these sort of uh sparse old testament references and then the references in hebrews <clears throat> i should have had hebrews already pulled up but <clears throat> all right so let's go to hebrews 7 <clears throat> Where this text is exegeted, this story is exegeted from the New Testament apostolic perspective, explaining its meaning. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of his portions. He tied to him, king of righteousness, and then king of Salem, king of peace. Now, people get confused because it says without father, without mother, without genealogy. doesn't mean he's an eternal person. It just means that the Old Testament doesn't list his genealogy, right? Throughout a lot of the Old Testament, we get genealogies because we want to know who descended from who. But the argument is being made that providentially, there is no listed genealogy, not because it's some demigod, but because it was a type of Jesus, right? Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but he is made like the Son of God and he remains a priest continually. So Melchizedek is an actual historical person and his priesthood is a type of Christ's priesthood. How do we know that Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Well, have you read the Psalms, right? What does the writer of Hebrews go on to argue? Now, let's just actually read this because... My argument is actually in Hebrews 7. It's not my argument, but it's a fitting argument to refute Islam, Protestantism, and Judaism. 
Now, concerning how great this man Melchizedek was, to whom Abraham, uh, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils, indeed, those who are sons of Levi receive the priesthood. So now he's contrasting the priesthood of Melchizedek to the priesthood of uh, the Mel, uh, of the uh, of Moses, uh, the Mosaic Covenant of, of Aaron, a.k.a. the Levitical priesthood. Those who are the sons of Levi, Levitical priesthood, receive this priesthood and have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, but uh, that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose gene genealogy is not derived from them, so in other words, Melchizedek is not a Levitical priest, but he's a divine priest. So how do we make sense of this? The argument of Hebrews is that it is a type, a foreshadowing of the Gentile priesthood that would be in Christ. The priests of the New Testament are priests after the order of Melchizedek. That's the point here. We are in the Protestants, by the way, we're going to see, I know every Protestant is going to say, we have the priesthood of all believers, friend. We have a priesthood, not a ministerial priesthood, friend, the priesthood of all believers. I know the Protestant view. We're going to get to that in a minute. Just hold your horses. Hold your horses, evangelical man. Now it says, now he whose genealogy is not derived from them, from, in other words, Melchizedek does not, have any connection to the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, yet he receives a tithe from Abraham, the greater of the Melchizedek, or excuse me, the greater of the Aaronic priesthood, or, or, or the, 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 uh, the Aaronic lineage, right? Abraham is the father of those under the Mosaic covenant because they come from Abraham. Do you understand? The, you guys follow me so far? So, the lesser Abraham is tithing to the greater is the argument here. In other words, because the Levitical priests were in the loins of Abraham, the Levitical priests in a way were tithing to Melchizedek. The lesser ties to the greater, not the other way around. So if the Levitical priests were in the loins of Abraham, hundreds of years before Moses and Aaron were born, and Abraham tithed to the greater Melchizedek, then the order of Melchizedek is greater than the Levitical priesthood. Now, this doesn't mean that Levitical priesthood was evil or that it was bad or that it didn't relate to Jesus. Guess what? Blow your mind here. <laughs> both Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood are types of Christ. They both point to Christ in different ways and in different senses and in different types. But the argument of the apologetics here in Hebrews is that the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the Aaronic priesthood. doesn't mean the Aaronic priesthood was bad, but it had a certain point. It had a certain purpose for a certain time. That's the argument here. And as you see the argument, even Levi, who receives tithes from the people of Israel, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was in the loins of his father, Abraham, when Melchizedek met him, Abraham. The need for a new priesthood. Therefore, if perfection could come about through the Levitical priesthood, for under the Levitical priesthood, the people received the Mosaic law, what further need was there for another priest who would rise according to the order of Melchizedek? Who are we talking about here? Jesus. And to not be called according to the order of Aaron. In other words, if there was another priest that came along and the Levitical priesthood was superior to the Melchizedek priesthood, then the new priest that came along would be of the order of Aaron. These are pretty simple arguments here. But he of whom these things are spoken, Melchizedek, belonged to some other tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. Okay? Nobody in Israel was officiating at the altar according to Melchizedek. That's the point here. For our Lord arose from Judah, of which Moses spoke nothing about priesthood. Okay, there's no mention of the Judaic priesthood in the old in, in Moses. And yet it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come according to the law, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, talking about the Moses, the ceremonial Mosaic law, but according to the power of an eternal life. In other words, the power that Christ possesses is superior to the Aaronic priesthood because it's the fulfillment of the Aaronic priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood, like Melchizedek himself, 
is pointing to another fulfillment. Thus, the citation from the Psalms about Christ, you are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who is that talking about? That's from the Psalms. David is not a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hello, Jews, Muslims, what is that Psalm talking about? I wonder. Who could it be <laughs> that is a priest after the order of Melchizedek? I mean, there's not that many options, right? I mean, how many people have even been thought of as a potential fulfillment of this? And so in uh, Orthodox Study Bible, that's Psalm 104, <clears throat> 9. Or is it 1094? I get it mixed up. 1094, excuse me. The Lord has sworn and will not change. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So who do we think that Psalm is talking about? Okay, nobody thinks that David was a priest. He's not. Okay, He's a king. And usually, most of the time, there's a couple uh, uh, examples where the threefold Old Testament office is, there's a person who occupies two, right? You might have somebody who's a prophet and a king, like David. Uh, you might have somebody who's a prophet and a priest, uh, like uh, Samuel. Um, but there's not anybody in the Old Testament, typically speaking, who is prophet, priest, and king. Right, this threefold office. <clears throat> this, of course, is a big point that we make about Christ because the Messiah, we would say, whenever the Messiah comes, due to all of the Old Testament Messianic prophecies, the Messiah uh, must fulfill these three offices. Right, Because there's so many prophecies, so many Messianic prophecies about what he will do, who he is, what his job is, what he will accomplish, etc., that all of those prophecies can be subdivided into his uh, fulfillment of office of priest, prophet, and king. So, but again, crucial point here, when we read this Psalm 109, <clears throat> let's go to that. Who do we think is talking here? And th this is a very powerful argument in the book of Hebrews that the writer is making. <clears throat> And remember, the context of Hebrews is people who want to go back to ceremonial laws. Oh, we, we got to have the shofar. We got to have the, the ceremonies of the temple uh, because, you know, Yahshua, you know, like, like the Messianic Jews think this way, right? Oh, you have to, the superstitious. Like you must use the word Yahshua because it has a special power that Jesus doesn't have. It's a silly superstition, right? But in Psalm 109, for, the, for, for our interpretation, the interpretation of the New Testament over and over and over, this dialogue that's written by David is a prediction, a prophecy that is not and cannot be primarily only about David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. I have begotten you from the womb before the morning star. Was David begotten before the morning star? You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Nobody thinks David was a priest forever according to the order. Of, there's nobody that teaches this. Maybe some weird cult somewhere thinks that <laughs> this is talking to David. And uh, I did hear a story one time that uh, some Mormons believe that they are some kind of descendants of, uh, I mean, this is whatever. That's not what, it's not about Mormons. Okay. Psalm 109 is not about Mormons. I can assure you that. Uh, but literally, uh, other than some weird Mormon interpretation, nobody thinks that David is a priest after the order of Melchizedek that I've ever heard of. Thus, <clears throat> this has typically been classed as a messianic prophecy. As far as I know, Jews still think that Psalm 109 or 110 in the Masoretic is a messianic prophecy. But as the writer of Hebrews is arguing and other, because this Psalm 1, uh, 110 is cited multiple times in the New Testament, right? And uh, rule, uh, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The New Testament always interprets that of the ascension, Christ's ascension into heaven. That's when he sat at the right hand of the Father to rule and to begin his ministerial priesthood. 
So keep in mind when Jesus ascended, I don't know, Protestants, I don't know if you didn't catch this. Protestants, did you catch the fact that when Jesus ascended, Hebrews says he's also doing the temple administration in heaven, in the true temple. So there's still sacrifice being offered. The eternal sacrifice being offered. Do you understand this? It was when Jesus died on the cross, friends, he said it is finished. And when he said it is finished, there is no longer any need for sacrifice. It is finished, friends. The temple was cracked. The veil was rent. Right, I know. I know every, I've heard it a million times. I know what you think. Okay, you don't have to repeat to me that you think the veil being rent and it is finished means that there's no such thing as sacrifice anymore. Yet, wait a minute. Every Protestant cites the New Testament where it says, become living sacrifices. You are my offering, Paul says. Wait a minute. But So is it finished or is there still sacrifice? Why does Paul say, I, I in my own body am fulfilling what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ? What? Yes, that's what Paul says. Now, Paul doesn't mean that there's inherently anything lacking. But what he means is that the mystical body of Christ, the church, will live out the life of Christ. If you know from our liturgical cycle, when you go to church, when you go to the divine liturgy, there's a, a church calendar. You are living out Christ's life every year. Likewise, the Christian is, we believe that we are living out the life of Christ in our lives, not just one year, but our whole life, right? Cycles of cycles. <clears throat> so, if Jesus is an eternal priest because he was forever the second person of the Godhead, there, it's an eternal oath and priesthood, the eternal covenant, it is called, then it is not finished in the way that you as a Protestant say. Do you see how this refutes you yourself? Wait a minute. It's finished, but what, he's an eternal priest. So what do you mean it's finished? Uh, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest until it is finished or a priest forever. He was not made a priest without an oath. The oath you are priest forever. And yet every Protestant in his folly rejects the idea of the Eucharist as an offering. For such a high priest was fitting for us. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, verse 25. He continues forever with an unchangeable priesthood. Eternal offering, goobers. Therefore, he is able to save because he always makes intercession. A priest intercedes. Now, every Protestant out there, friends, we're going to have intercessory prayer tonight at church. Come on down to the church hall. We're going to have intercessory prayer for sister so-and-so. She's got cancer. Intercession? That's an action of an existing priesthood. So wait a minute. You don't actually believe in it is finished. Nothing else need be done. Well, then why, why are you interceding if it's finished? Why do you have to repent if it's finished? Okay, so you don't actually think that it's finished actually means what you think it means, you see. You're not consistent with what you think it means. Because you still believe in priestly offerings, intercession. But guess what? And some boomer Protestant woman tried to scold me in the comments today. She's going she's gonna to get scolded right back because she said, Hey, Bruce, 13 does not mean what you think it means. Me, 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 me. Oh, really? Well, tell me what it means. I'm sure you know. Hebrews 13 does not mean what I think it means. Well, let's see what it says. Okay. So uh, hopefully everybody sees the argument, the line of argumentation uh, so far. <clears throat> Then we have this uh, important statement at the end of Hebrews 13 in the benediction, benediction. Now may the God of peace, by the way, this is like the blessing of the Old Testament. So the author of Hebrews is doing a priestly blessing. 
a benediction. May the God of peace, who brought our Lord Jesus Christ up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, <clears throat> through the blood of the eternal covenant. So it's an eternal covenant. Does that make sense? It's ever being ever presented. That's what happens in the Eucharistic liturgy. Okay, so Protestants have a huge problem with this. Okay, just like they have a, they, just as much as a, pro, a problem they have with the real presence, they have equally as much a problem with the idea of the Eucharist being an offering that the church or that Christ himself offers to God. And yet that's what our liturgy tells us. Thine own of thine own we offer unto thee. <clears throat> All right, so it's an everlasting eternal covenant, but let's go back. <clears throat> we have an altar, an altar, from, the, from which those who serve in the tabernacle have no right to eat. So again, remember the purpose of Galatians, the purpose of Hebrews was to show the superiority of what Christ has brought and the inferiority, not because it was bad, but because what it was about has now come. In other words, the argument is that Ceremonial laws, the temple, the tabernacle, the altar, the animal sacrifices, the rituals, the feasts, they're not bad. It wasn't given by an evil God. They were temporary. And their whole purpose was pointing to the reality that we have now. Doesn't mean it's all X'd out and done away with. That's another stupid Protestant idea. Jesus didn't say that it's all done away with. I have come to destroy and X out the Old Testament. And yet how many Protestants and evangelicals think this? Not all of them, but many of them. But notice, and it also applies to Islam, eternal priesthood forever, according to the word of Melchizedek. It's not made up and corrupted by Jews and Christians. We didn't make this up. It's in the text. We have an altar from which those who serve in the tabernacle, that is the Jews that serve in the tabernacle, they don't have a right to eat at this altar because they're still under and believe the ceremonial Mosaic commands in the sense that they're not fulfilled in Christ. Because we still believe those commands have value and relevance, okay? We don't believe as Orthodox that all the ceremonies and all that is just dumb and useless, wiped away, and uh, oh, none of that means anything. God didn't care about that. It was just sort of this thing that happened. And uh, then Jesus came and he's like, love or whatever. Who's like this mean God or whatever, the Old Testament. Like he gave all these rules and then Jesus came and he's like, peace and love or whatever, right? No, that's idiot, low IQ, you know, DMT bro stuff. We don't, that's not what we think. But notice the argument here. We in the church have an altar that we eat from. Now, this boomer woman in the comments, I'm not joking. And it was so dumb, I just deleted the comment. I just blocked it. She says, that ain't talking about what you think it is. That's all. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual altar, and we spiritually eat. Then how come uh, immediately after this was written, all of the Christians that we can go read in the first, second century, how come they believed it was out about the Eucharist? How come they didn't spiritualize it? Why do they say have your Eucharist under your bishop. Why do they teach that it is the real body and blood of Christ, the real body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, according to St. Cyril? They don't spiritualize it. No, you spiritualize it because the ethos of Protestantism is Gnostic. It is fundamentally iconoclastic, like Islam, because there is some notion, some fundamental assumption that God is opposite matter. God is anti-matter. He's not, not any matter. <laughs> not like a Dan Brown novel, but against, opposed to matter. Okay. Because somehow matter is tainted. It's bad. It's lesser, right? These are all Gnostic ideas. And why do they think that? Because of some weird interpretation of, you shall have no engraving images. That's it. Because the Old Testament says, not to have graven images, all of these people have thought that God is opposed to all images, even though the very chapters of Exodus where he says that, he also says, carve a bunch of images in the temple. So 
So I'm not trying to be mean to people. It's my catchphrase now. My uh, comedian catchphrase, which I didn't even, it just happened. Not trying to be mean, dude. Right. But this is not a difficult point here. Most of what we're talking about is based in ignorance. Okay. And I'm uh, Christians too. A lot of Christians, so-called, right? Ignorant of what? Ignorant of the Old Testament. The root problem here for uh, the Muslim and a lot of the Protestants is ignorance of what the Old Testament actually says, what it actually teaches. But particularly when it comes to critiquing the Muslim position, I just can't understand how they have almost no, they don't understand, they just don't get this argument and this point. Do you understand that you can't say that you follow the law and the prophets of the Torah and then turn around and say 70% of it is made up, corrupted, heresy? It's just, it makes no sense. Especially given the fact that the Quran says it is not corrupted. Now we see then that the, the argument of the writer of Hebrews is really what I'm honing in on. And that is that in the New Testament, we do have the continuation of liturgical elements that did not pass away. For example, in the book of Acts, we read about them having many candles, lights. That's liturgical lamps. That's candles for vigils. We read about benedictions that we just saw at the end of Hebrews. That's a liturgical event. Okay. We read about Paul in his epistles citing various early creeds and hymns. Those are liturgical elements. Do you understand that? So the point is that to the Protestant, there is no New Testament letter that tells you how to worship. Do you think that God... Uh, wants us to make up the way that he that we want to worship. Do you think that's a, a principle anywhere in Scripture <laughs> that, that God uh, sort of do I, DIY? Okay, is there anything like that at all ever? Now remember, Protestants, you guys believe that so Bible alone. So before the Bible was put together in the canon, the later centuries of the church. The Bible as we know it. Everybody's just, what, copying scrolls and doing the best that they can? Okay, so how do we do the worship in the church? Now, this is important because this is where there's this assumption on the part of the Protestant reformers, as well as Islam and other groups. This doesn't really apply to Judaism, but for uh, Protestants and to a degree Islam, the assumption is that there's this LCD, lowest common denominator, low church religion that the apostles established. There's a low church uh, seed teaching. Okay. And every product, there's every product has different ideas about what it is, but it's, it's a total presupposition. It's a false presupposition, but it's, it's, it's every Protestant's presupposition. And the only way that it differs from the uh, Muslim is that the Muslim thinks that there was this uh, basic monotheism that Jesus taught that got corrupted. Okay. Protestants, it's this basic Christianity that got corrupted in the early church. Okay. So basically the same idea, just differing in the degrees of the basic gospel to the Protestant. What is the basic gospel? Is it the necessity? Do you have to be baptized? Is it faith apart from works? Is it just belief in Jesus? And they think that these home churches is the justification. So basically it's like, well, the New Testament says there were home churches and therefore they didn't have a liturgy. They just met together and they had a meal and they prayed and they read the Bible. Okay. That's what most of the Protestants think is going on. Is that what happens? Uh, did you read Acts 15? perhaps where there's a council and there's a decision made that's binding on the churches. That doesn't seem like something that low church home church groups do. I have never heard of a home church group having a council that binds all the, I mean, this is silly, right? 
And if I say something like this, some goober Protestant will say, I'm part of a home church group, and we have a council that binds all the home churches. I mean, come on. Nobody, ex nobody believes that your home church can bind another home church to your decrees. This is silly. So there's a fundamental question of structure and of liturgy that is seemingly absent in the New Testament text. Now, when it comes to structure, there's a little more, right? We have more about church government in the New Testament where we have mentioned the episcopate, the diaconate, and the presbyterate or priesthood. Okay, so we do have these three words in these offices in the New Testament, and we've done talks about uh, apostolic succession, all that. We're not going to do that today. But the ministerial priesthood is, in, in our view, principally represented in the bishop, the priest, and the diaconate. Again, three levels of office mentioned in the New Testament, we believe is the succession to, he who hears you hears me, right? Jesus says to the apostles, the apostles then go out. This was so important what's in the book of Timothy, right? Paul says to Timothy, I laid hands on you. You don't lay hands on anyone else unless they're good men. Be sure and test them because the laying on of hands transfers the Holy Spirit. Clear as day what he says to Timothy. He says, you are appointed as the authority in Ephesus. Protestants, did you read that? And then he says, you lay hands on someone after you. They will lay hands on someone after them. Apostolic succession. He who hears you, hears me. Jesus breathes on them. Whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they retain. That's not Protestant at all. Totally contrary to the entire spirit and ethos of Protestantism. So what is fundamentally missing in the Protestant ethos here? By removing the Bible from its context of liturgy and making it a book alone religion, like Islam, like Judaism or Talmudic Judaism, it has now excised itself from the ethos of the religion and the community which gave them the book, acted as if the book is independent of the community and the ethos of worship, the liturgy, and now it has this book alone, but the book doesn't tell you how to worship. Now, does God care about how he's worshipped? Let's see. Leviticus 10, the profane fire of Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu got creative. They were a charismatic worship service people. I love you. Yeah. Right. And they want to offer incense their own creative way. And they took fire, put it in, and they offer profane fire because God did not command them to do this. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them and they died that day. So God seems to care about the way that he's worshiped, doesn't he? There's no do DIY. Now, if there's no DIY and God cares about how he's worshipped, why, Protestants, is there no letter of Paul of how to do the liturgy? Again, doesn't it matter? It seems to matter. Where is the list of do this first, do this second, do this, this, do this, this way? There's not, there is not. There's letters like Corinthians that are critiquing the problems but there's no liturgical service. Now let's take a, uh, let's move over to an example of where this is a problem. Let's say, so in my past, <clears throat> I went from evangelical to reformed. And one of the reasons that I, not the only, but one of the many reasons that I was interested in the reformed church was because they were the first that I ever heard in the Protestant world talking about this problem of worship. Hey, wait a minute. God doesn't just let us DIY. You can't just do whatever you want. There's a certain way to do it. God's not the other confusion. So how do we worship? Well, the reformed Protestant, the, the classic reformed argument is we can't worship God in any way other than how he wants us to worship him. So how do we do that? Well, uh, the only thing in the Bible. Okay, so this is not a goober protestant thing for you to come in here and start yelling and get get out of here dude well so in the reform view the idea is well the only the only book that we have in the bible about worship is the psalms and so there were protestants who said reformed who said you can only sing psalms other reformed split with them because in the new testament we have statements about 
sing hymns and spiritual songs. So wait a minute, can we sing sing hymns or are we only allowed to sing the Psalms? Right? This is a reformed debate. I'm not joking. It's called Psalm only. What about instruments? There's Protestants and Reformed and Calvinist Puritans who think you can't have instruments. So again, the point is that it's not clear in the New Testament. And the New Testament was never intended to be its own standing thing. Because it goes along with the Old Testament. And it goes along with not just the Old Testament temple, but the, the synagogue service. So the synagogue and the temple influence the way that the church's worship developed. So, again, you see the problem here that uh, if Sola Scripture is true, it not it curious that we don't have an actual worship service in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, that we're told how to do it in the New Testament way. And every single Protestant has his own idea and his own cult and his own sect that they make up about how to worship. This is a key point for orthodoxy because not only do we have liturgies that arise from without question all liturgical scholars agree that the ancient liturgies arise from the apostolic post-apostolic period the ancient roman liturgy the ancient liturgy of saint mark at alexandria liturgy of saint james right these are ancient liturgies from the first and second century and guess what that style of worship is well it's liturgical worship it is not low church, do-it-yourself worship. In fact, from the earliest days, there is already the continuity of the Old and New Testament seen in the visual iconographic representations of vestments, altar, Eucharist, ordered liturgical service, antiphonal singing in the New Testament. Where does that come from? From the Old Testament. Thus, this book, which you see me reference all the time, Orthodox Worship, Continuity Between the Synagogue, the Temple, and the Early Church. Key text. Key text. Why? What's the argument here? Because... If we knew our Old Testament, if we knew the Torah, if we knew it well, when we went to church, this all comes alive. You see it everywhere. By the way, uh, guys, if you would hit like and share also... Um, Remind you that I, uh, Jamie and I and uh, Father Vladimir, we will be speaking at my event in Orlando. You can still get tickets for the Orlando, Orlando event there. September 3rd, that is coming up pretty quick, but there's still tickets left, so you can still get tickets. And it's a little more because uh, there's more speakers. Um, Kotel, I think, might speak for a few minutes at the beginning. And then we got... Uh, me doing my little uh, jokey thing. And then we will have um, Jamie do her presentation, uh, then Father Vladimir, and then me, and then we'll have uh, open forum and book signing. So it's going to be a fun evening, uh, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. If you want to come out to the Orlando event, there is the link. Uh, so come meet us, come hang out. And uh, yes, there will be liturgy at church. I will be going, obviously, to Father Vladimir's church. So uh, yes, that's available as well. And um, yeah, I drank a whole bunch of espresso. Like I, I downed a whole thing of espresso before I did this. So that's why I'm over here burping. But also, fish. if you take fish oil, all right, it does that to you. Okay, so... <clears throat> All right, so we did Melchizedek. We talked about uh, the New Testament worship. So what's the point of all this? Well, the point of all this is to say then that, let's, let's look at this. It's 
Let's take a look at the temple here and its administrations and get an idea of, uh, oh, we don't want to go to the Jehovah's Witness website. Forget that. <laughs> uh, let's see. This might work. Maybe we get a good idea from this. Let's see if I can blow this up. Ugh, no. It's like every cult's got their... <laughs> Why are we getting all the cult stuff? No, we don't want uh, Jehovah's Witness. Oh, these Protestants always love this kind of stuff. They go crazy with this. The irony, of course, is that all this stuff is pointing to what the Orthodox Church has, but... Okay, so uh, here's the temple. Hopefully you can kind of see that. Maybe I can make this bigger like this. Let's do it this way. All right. So let's start with this one. So you'll notice that out you have the uh, altar for the burnt offering out here, right? And it's outside the temple. And uh, Christ, of course, is crucified outside Jerusalem. So there's multiple, many ways in which the altar of burnt offering uh, refers to what Christ does on the cross. If you remember uh, the recent talk that Seraphim Hamilton and I did, um, he went into some interesting, uh, and, and it might not have been that one, it might have been a couple talks back with Seraphim, but he went into a lot of the uh, elements of the, the Levitical burnt offering and the sweet, sweet smelling sacrifice. Then, of course, we have the laver. Uh, and, of course, the priestly laver of washing, obviously that for us is about baptism, right? All, all of these things in the temple and tabernacle, you notice the Protestant exegesis typically says, oh, uh, that's all just Jesus. And we agree it's about Jesus, but it's not just about Jesus. It's also about the New Testament sacraments that Jesus instituted. And one of those would be baptism. And so for us, baptism is not just a symbol. Because guess what? In the Old Testament, they were just symbols. Okay, So the Protestant unwittingly undermines the force and import of the New Testament rituals being a fulfillment of Old Testament rituals. The Old Testament rituals don't just point to the person of Jesus. They also point to the sacraments that he instituted. And they don't just point to like symbol to symbol. It's symbol to fulfillment symbol to reality so every time a protestant argues that baptism does the exact same thing as circumcision he's undercutting it is a there's a a parallel but it's the fulfillment of circumcision remember the religion was intended to go to the whole world not everybody in the world could be circumcised duh okay but everybody in the world can be dunked in water right so the simplifying of the means the matter of the sacrament doesn't mean that it's a low church and it's just bread water and wine it's simplified to be available to all but it's a reality that is brought to all that the old testament sim uh, symbolized it is pointless to go from symbol to symbol So the Old Testament washings and circumcision are symbols that point to the reality that baptism actually accomplishes. Otherwise, the movement makes no sense from symbol to symbol. How can the New Testament rituals be fulfillments if they don't do anything different than what the Old Testament did? That's just a symbol, friend. It's just a symbol, friend. Okay, but the Old Testament was all symbols. So what? Again, the Eucharist is not merely a symbol because the animal sacrifices were symbols. The animal sacrifices point also to the Eucharist, which is not just a symbol. It is the flesh and blood of Christ. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood, and then you have eternal life in you because it is the flesh and blood, St. Cyril says, of some random guy. No, of the God-man the second person of the Godhead, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is not a creature. He's the second person, of the, the eternal son of God. That is the angel of the Lord, same person, identical, same thing. And all these rituals, guess what? Jesus gave the rituals. 
Jesus wasn't created by God. His human nature, he created his own human nature. Okay. And this temple also symbolizes his created human nature. Do you see the inner gold and the outer stone? According to many of the church fathers, the inner gold, his divine nature, the outer stone, his human nature. And remember, symbols are polyvalent. They don't just stand for one thing. All the low IQ bad arguments, all the dumb heretics, they always think words only have one reference. They only mean one thing. Okay, well, the temple stands for a bunch of things. It is a type of Mary. Mary had God within her. She gave birth to God the Son. So Mary is a kind of temple. Paul calls, the New Testament writers call the church the temple. So the temple is a type of the church, meaning the people, but also meaning the entire collective universal body of Christ. All of the people who are in Christ is also the temple, right? When we go inside this temple, uh, let's see if we can find these pictures. Not very good. This one might be a little better. I can barely see that. Let's see if we can zoom in on this thing. Okay, let's see if we... I can barely see that myself, so... Let's see. Okay, if you notice here, let's see. So when we come into the temple, <clears throat> you can barely see it, but there's supposed to be uh, the table of showbread or the manna. And the table of showbread was a reminder of the provi provision of God in the wilderness. Okay, how does Jesus exegete uh, the manna in John 6? Well, he says it's the Eucharist, right? So notice then you have the, the altar excuse me, outside, uh, the labor of washing before you enter in. When you enter into the temple, then you're in the holy place, right? So the outer portico, we're going to go through different uh, meanings of this in a second here, but outside is for the nations, right? Uh, only Jews could enter into the holy place, and then only the high priest could enter into that inner holy of holies there. And we're going to see what that symbolized in a minute. But uh, So we notice the implements inside the temple. We have a uh, carved images all over the walls notice the walls have i can't i can barely see what it is in this picture but it looks like uh, you know angels and stuff right so like cherubim seraphim right uh oh images uh oh uh oh so clearly the ten commandments are not forbidding all images because there's images in the temple and not just that the ark is an image and it's got images of seraphim on top of it so we have the table of showbread, and the showbread, as we said, was a uh, the the bread of the presence, the bread that reminded them of God's provision in the wilderness, uh, the manna, and then that uh, obviously for us would point to the Eucharist as well. And then we have uh, the altar of incense. Uh, the church has retained incense because in the book of Revelations, if you read chapters 4, 5, and 6, you'll see that uh, from our vantage point, John is looking into heaven and seeing a temple worship service. He's not just seeing random, uh, in coat, uh, disorganized visions. He's seeing a worship service. And in our view, when he says at the beginning of the book, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, John is saying, I was worshiping. On Sunday, I was at the, in other words, I was at the divine liturgy on Sunday, <laughs> right? And he might've been, you know, alone in the Isle of Patmos, but he could still have a worship service because he's an apostle, right? And what's he see? He sees into heaven and sees a heavenly liturgy. He sees people wearing vestments. He sees incense. In other words, he sees them, the saints in heaven that were martyred offering as incense, the prayers of the saints on earth. So every day, some Protestant says to me, why do you believe in the prayers, the praying to saints? Well, we don't pray to the saint as if it was a God. Okay, We are asking the saints to intercede for us because they are in heaven 
involved in a heavenly worship service, right? Everybody follow that. If you don't, we can go to the text in a minute if you guys aren't familiar with it. But for now, let's just set that aside. We'll look at the apocalypse in a minute. But so we see this here and then uh, the incense and there's also the lampstands. Who does John say is the represent? The, well, the lampstands represent angels. They represent the seven spirits of God, which Isaiah talks about, which are divine energies, according to Isaiah. What is Isaiah 11? Uh, and then it represents the seven churches of Asia Minor in his letter. And it represents the bishops of the churches, the angels of the churches. Okay. So in our view, it stands for all those things. But the lampstand is primarily an image of the church, but it's also an image of the tree, the tree of life. It's also an image of the cross. It's also an image of the universe. And I covered that in my video I just did the other day about the symbolism of the tree of life. Okay, everybody remember that? Well, so th those are all things clearly in our view that point to the New Testament. They point to the work of Christ. But one key point where we depart from the Protestants is that the Protestant thinks that there's some sort of like denigrating aspect to any of this carrying over into the worship. So it has to be like this mental thing. Oh yeah, sure. All of that stuff points to Jesus and his work, but friends, Jesus said it is finished. There's no longer need for a temple. There's no longer need for sacrifice. There's no longer. And yet he turns around and says, we must give ourselves as sacrifice. We must give ourselves to be a living temple. Exactly. So what does Peter say? I saw him on the Holy Mount. Uh oh. So you're saying, wait a minute, Peter in the New Testament says that when he saw Jesus transfigured, it was the holy mountain. Uh oh. That means that in the New Testament, there's still holy places, sites, locations that are uniquely holy, a holy place. Protestants don't think that way. Friends, everywhere is holy. There's no holy place. Everywhere is holy. Really? Why does Peter say, I saw him on the holy mount? No, there are still holy things. What does it say in the book of Acts? They brought cloths from Paul's body and laid it upon those who were possessed and the demons left. Those are called relics. So the New Testament has relics. So the New Testament has over and over and over things that we see as part of the Old Testament service. And so we come up with this uh, important question that the New Testament, in, just in terms of the text itself, doesn't immediately resolve. And the question is, what elements of the Old Testament worship service and liturgy carry over? What about an altar? Does an altar carry over? What about a priesthood? Does a priesthood carry over? What about bread? What about wine? And you could say, well, okay, but bread and wine are mentioned in the New Testament. Yeah, but how are we supposed to interpret bread and wine in the New Testament? Is it just a symbol? Is it a real presence? Is the bread and wine supposed to be the climax of our worship service? Or is reading the Bible and the preacher standing up there in his business suit the climax of the worship service? You see how this is uh, interpreted very differently between Protestants and Catholics? I mean, excuse me, Protestants and Orthodox. And we're going to get to the Catholics in a minute because I said we would get to that. But uh, I'm going to have to go to the little boy's wee wee room because I drank a whole bunch of coffee. So hold your horses. Don't go anywhere. Uh, once again, you can watch my uh, music video about mind control, which doesn't make any sense in terms of what we're talking about. But it's right here handy. So don't go anywhere. But I do have to wee wee. I'll be right back.
All right. <clears throat> Back to the temple. So uh, we have here in the Holy of Holies, as hopefully most of you guys know, the holiest of objects, the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant had the pot of manna, another reminder of the manna in the wilderness. It had uh, Aaron's rod, a tree that blossomed miraculously, the tree of the cross, the tree of life. Again, the tree imagery, I just covered this. But inside the Ark was the Ten Commandments, right? The tabular, the tablet word of God, the uh, pot of manna. Again, the miraculous bread, uh, the reminder of Exodus, and Aaron's rod that blossomed. All of those for us point to Christ. Christ is the tree that blossoms, the, the tree of life. <clears throat> Christ is the manna, uh, according to John 6. And Christ is also the Ark of the New Covenant uh, because he is Emmanuel, God with us. The Ark was the presence and power of God with the Israelites, right? And that for us is a type or a foreshadowing of the Incarnation. It's also a foreshadowing and a type of the Virgin Mary. Mary, the Theotokos, obviously is the Ark who had within her the Son of God. She was uh, the presence of God amongst the people uh, by being the uh, mother of God, right? And having acquiescing to in the uh, annunciation when Gabriel visits her, yes, let it be done according to me, according to thy word. So <clears throat> another element though, that's often missed that the book of Hebrews makes a big deal about is the yearly feasts of the Jews, particularly the day of atonement, because on the day of atonement, as you guys know, the way it worked for the Jews was that the priest, hopefully you guys know this, the high priest, right, is the only one who could enter into the inner sanctum. So the inner sanctum is that little door, the, the, the little inner, inner thing, right? So only uh, believing Gentiles could be outside the temple. That's the uh, portico of the nations, you could say. The inner place, Jews, only Jews could walk into the temple. And then only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year. And he, uh, by the way, if he messed up, might die, right? So they would attach a rope to him. <laughs> they would. Uh, he had little bells uh, on the bottom of his vestments so that they could listen and make sure he's still jingling. And if there was no jingling, uh-oh, we might have to pull him out because nobody can go in there. And also, you couldn't, uh, only Levites could touch the ark, right? So there's these, these strictures put upon uh, who can do what, Again, gigantic portions of the Old Testament deal with this. So <clears throat> then the uh, Ark of the Covenant, as we said, uh, is was also called the mercy seat, right? This is the meeting place of God with men. Again, Jesus incarnate is the meeting place of God amongst men. Uh, he's Jacob's ladder, right? All of these Old Testament images are pointing to Christ. But what we're talking about here is the Day of Atonement and the idea that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, as you can see here, would take the blood of the sacrifice. He would walk into the inner sanctum and then into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood of the sacrifice to, quote, provide atonement for the people. Now, even the Old Testament tells us that the blood of goats and bulls doesn't placate God. The blood of goats and bulls doesn't actually achieve forgiveness of sins. So what was the point of all this? Is it just made up? Is it just pagan stuff? No. If we read the book of Hebrews, we know very clearly what the point is. The point of this was to explain what the Messiah would do throughout his whole life and ministry. And so not only would he come to be born and dwell amongst men, but he would also complete the duties of a high priest because the, he's the eternal high priest, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, who also fulfills the priesthood of Aaron. And just as the Aaronic high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and accomplish atonement in a symbolic way on the Day of Atonement every year for the Jews, so Jesus, when he 
ascended into heaven, this is the argument of Hebrews, get this, would ascend into not just the sky, not just the heaven of space, but the heaven of heavens, the third heavens, God's throne, and achieve an eternal atonement by eternally presenting himself to the Father, eternally on the eternal altar of sacrifice in heaven, where he eternally officiates as high priest and as sacrifice. That is the meaning of the temple for us, and it doesn't go away. It is still the case because in the Eucharist, we are participating in that same thing that is going on in heaven. So in other words, what's going on on earth in the temple and tabernacle was a type of the heavenly liturgy and worship, the eternal liturgy and worship, and in the New Testament, we believe that the church is the reality of heaven and earth meeting. It is the same service. The liturgy that's going on on earth is the same one, not a type, right? Old Testament is pointing up to what's going on in heaven. New Testament, because Christ is incarnate, it's joined. So the liturgy on earth is the liturgy in heaven. That's the Orthodox view. See the difference there. Thus, when we read the Apocalypse, let's go over here to the Apocalypse and we'll see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> we'll start, uh, dang it, in five. Or maybe we should start in four. Because if we notice as John is moving uh, through his descriptors, in uh, 4, 5, and 6, he's describing what he sees as are so annoying, in heaven. I was in the spirit. Behold, uh, I looked a throne in heaven. One who sat on the throne. Obviously, we know it's from the rest of the epistle that this is uh, Jesus. And remember in uh, Revelation 1, John describes Jesus when he appears to him exactly the same way as Ezekiel describes one like the Son of Man, the glory of God that he met. Ezekiel says he saw the glory of God, the second person of the Godhead, on a, one like the Son of Man on a throne. Who is that? I wonder. So hard. Oh, so hard to figure out. I can't wonder who he's talking about. And he who sat on the throne was like, again, the descriptors of, uh, uh, from Exodus, the uh, Jasper, the Sardius, etc. Emeralds, all of the uh, rubies and whatnot description. And then he sees the elders in heaven. The saints that have gone on, they have crowns of gold, okay, halos, uncreated, uncreated light. We see the throne, uh, lightning proceeding, thundering voices, seven lamps. Okay, this is a liturgy. The lamps, the seven lamps before the throne. This is the lamps that we saw in the temple that we just looked at. In other words, the temple on earth is a symbol, a little miniature, a little model of what was in heaven. Because remember, Paul says that Moses received the pattern of worship based on what was in heaven. The whole argument of the New Testament and of the Orthodox Church is that the reality of the worship, that the Old Testament temple was a type, has come in Jesus, in the New Testament, in the church. It's the same thing as what's in heaven. Do you see that? That's the argument. So, Muslims... Where is any of this? Where is any of this in your theology? We'll get to the uh, points again about the altar and the throne. But look, so in heaven, what does John see? Well, he sees lamps. He sees uh, uh, a throne. He sees uh, elders. Uh, and let's move to five. So are you noticing that he's seeing liturgical things? This is stuff from the temple, guys. Temple stuff, Levitical stuff. Do you not know this? Okay. Then he sees uh, the lamb, one on the throne, opening up seven seals. We know these are the seal judgments. Who is it on the throne? It is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's Jesus. Okay. Everybody knows this, hopefully. 
Uh, we see, by the way, uh, he's described as the lamb. Where does the lamb imagery come from? Passover, the lamb of Passover. Worthy is the lamb. Again, none of this makes any sense if you don't have Levitical Exodus history in mind, right? Okay, so he sees this, uh, his blood, the blood of the sacrifice of the lamb, all Levitical imagery. He has made us to be kings and priests, priestly imagery, temple imagery. Uh, I know that Muslims don't accept this. This is against the Protestant. This was the point I said Protestants, we would look at, why you pray to saints? Why come you pray to saints? That's pagan. We don't pray to the saints. I'm going to show you why we do what we do. Okay, so he sees a giant. This is a worship service. Okay, they're doing worship. They're not doing crazy charismatic worship. They're not flopping around and acting like retards and dogs. Are they? No. They're doing liturgical worship. It's singing. It's antiphonal, right? Then he sees uh, cherubim, living creatures. They start participating in the worship. He sees angels. He sees what is on the temple walls. He sees the reality of what the temple was sim sim signifying. Do you understand that? Okay, so key text here, Protestants. This is for you guys because I get this asked this every day. Now the Lamb opened the seals. Uh, okay, come and see. Behold, crown conquering. Okay. We see war and conflict on the earth. Martyrs. Then he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony. They cried out, How long, O Lord? Okay, again, Protestants, do you not realize this is a worship service? Do you think this is just people like flopping around, acting like charismatic goobers in heaven? No, it's a service. It's a divine liturgy. Okay. And they're praying. Who are the saints, the martyrs praying for? They're praying for vengeance for the saints persecuted on earth. Okay, then they're given a robe. Oh, that sounds like liturgy. Okay, then we see a uh, moon turn to blood. Okay. Okay, then we have the ceiling. Uh oh. Then we go back to five. I forgot the text in five here. <clears throat> now, when he had taken the scroll, the living creatures and the elders fell down before the Lamb, each of them having a heart with golden bowls of incense. So the saints are in heaven offering bowls of incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. So the saints in heaven, the martyrs that have gone on, are offering as incense in heaven prayers of the saints on earth, as we just saw in the, in the other chapter. This is why we believe that the entire church on earth and in heaven is part of the same worship service. So in other words, it's like me saying, hey, psst, St. Athanasius, psst, pray for me, because he's there in the service. That's it. That's, that's what all you people divided over all you protestants are mad about you think it's pagan no it's not pagan it's right there it's the same liturgical worship service and david by the way in the psalms speaks to the angels in the liturgy in the worship service so if you understand the context all this makes perfect sense nothing to do with paganism nothing to do with contacting the dead is a sorcerer that's what they always think okay it's none of that So, what's the uh, conclusion here? Let me show you this. All right, let's just do it this way. <clears throat> so,
So in the Orthodox Church, then you'll notice that, uh, as an example, here, so the for us then, here are some of the elements that we believe do carry over. Not arbitrarily, but according to ancient patristic tradition from the earliest times, you will find the church worshiping in a Eucharistic sacrificial altar way. And I can barely see this. I wish I could make this bigger. But you'll notice that you, you see we have similar things to what existed in the temple. And in fact, you'll notice the structure and look of every Orthodox church is actually very similar to both the synagogue and the temple, and that's on purpose. And so you'll notice there the, uh, the Eucharist then has the prime place in the worship service. And so it is seen to be the uh, offering. And not only that, we've actually maintained, we've re retained the idea of things being set off as holy. So if we look over here, you'll notice that not everybody has the right and the authority to just walk up there and worship and do whatever they want, right? You can't do that. Only men are allowed on the altar and only a male priesthood qualifies as a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. So you'll see then these that, that behind the iconostasis, the reason there's, there's an iconostasis there is that that's a tradition where the church had an altar and even ancient churches have this rail or this guardway okay, from the earliest centuries that sets the Eucharistic altar off from the congregation. Okay. And, and Protestants just simply don't know that this actually goes way back. And I've covered that article many, many, many times. Uh, I'll share it again for you guys because it always comes up. Um, I think it was a Catholic guy that wrote it. but uh, It's about how the early home churches, you can look at archaeology, show that they were uh, liturgical. So, this is, no, I don't want to promote Tim Staples talking about it. Uh, it's on, it's on Ortho Christian somewhere. Uh, here it is. The Eucharistic Liturgy in the Ancient House Churches. So, go and check this out and you'll see that well, a lot of times what they would do is convert, uh, a, a rich person's villa, okay? And then they would mark off the altar area for the Eucharist, right? Oh, I've got that too zoomed in. Sorry about that. Let me fix that. So. There. Hopefully you can see that. So I can barely see that. So if somebody's, uh, some rich person had a house church and they converted, right? This is where we get basilicas from. It's like rich people converting their houses into churches. Okay. And then you have, um, there's another picture that's actually better than this one. If I can find it, let me put this in the chat for you guys. Because there's another picture that shows how they had the Eucharist, uh, the altar and everything kind of marked off as separate. But you, you can begin to see how uh, this is based on, that's not it, the idea that we should still retain the idea of things being set apart and holy in the New Testament. Right? This is not a purely Old Testament idea. The New Testament has carried over that's not it. I think it was on some Catholic guy, like a Catholic uh, liturgical scholars website. And he has a picture where the, it shows the way that they would set off. Maybe it's this guy. Let's see what this is. 
they would set the, uh, they still had an altar is what I'm trying to say. No, that's not it. Let's see if we can find it. No, that's not it. I don't know. I can't find it, but somebody can find it. Because uh, somebody, this has been copied a million times on a bunch of different websites, but if we can find the original article, it'd be best. Uh, is it the Cold to Communion guys, maybe? Uh, nope, that's not it. Uh, is it that? No, that's not it. It's like a Catholic website talking about, it's some Catholic liturgy guy. Like a, it might have even been a Catholic bishop. I don't remember. Does anybody know the article I'm talking about? Does anybody find it? No, that's not it. Anyway, I don't know. I can't find it, but. Hopefully you get the point of what I'm trying to say. Um, oh, maybe it's this one. No, that's not it. Maybe it's, it's something. Oh, maybe that's it. No, that's not it. Oh, it's a specific. I know what it is. It's specifically about home churches. That's it. Well, the. Yes, I think this is it. This is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay, so here's the original. That's probably the same one, though. I thought this had it marked off for... I've seen another illustration where the altar would be in the early church. I wish I could find that one. I don't remember where it is, but anyway. Maybe it's this one. Oh, maybe it's this one. No, that's not it. Anyway, I give up. But, I mean, we can, you guys realize we can read people from the first and second century. Like, we can go read Ignatius, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and we can see how they worshipped. Okay, and, and they all describe it as a liturgical worship. Okay, so, like, this shouldn't be that. It shouldn't even be that controversial. I wish I could find that one uh, thing where they had it. You could you could see in the house churches how they had it divided where the uh, altar was. Um, anyway. But back to the point, uh, when it comes to the Orthodox Church, that's the whole pu purpose of the iconostasis. Uh, in, the, in the West, it was a rail, right? So they had the... Uh, communion rail, uh, the, 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 the Latin rite churches, the Western rite Orthodox still have the rail. Uh, but even in the ancient Western rites of the first thousand years, is it, if you look at the old ancient churches and what what's still exists in terms of architecture, uh, they actually look like Orthodox churches too, the ancient Western churches, ironically. So, but, um, Uh, I don't like this website, but this looks like they're making my point that the setup of our altar comes from the Old Testament. And that's why, again, we still have the altar because, as we saw, Hebrews 13, we have an altar that we eat from that the priests at the tabernacle have no right to eat from. Paul describes the New Testament meal as the Eucharist as an offering. He uses offering language in his epistles and in Corinthians, uh, 
the offering is identified as the body of Christ in the book of Hebrews as an eternal offering. We also see in the New Testament that, uh, by the way, I'll get to the Super Chats in a second, guys. Um, that this, this is an, an ordered worship service, right? It's not a DIY thing. <clears throat> and we see that the priesthood continues in the New Testament as a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, just briefly read this. Uh, in the first covenant, that is the old covenant, there were regulations of worship for an earthly sanctuary. The tent was prepared, the outer one, the lampstand, the bread of the presence, as it called the holy place. This is where everything I just went through. Um, he mentions what was inside the ark. Uh, this is all from Hebrews. One of the neat things about orthodoxy is that our traditions go back not only to uh, early Christianity, but in terms of, uh, in some cases, things before Christ. The setup of the temple, for example. We read about the temple in Exodus uh, and about it in the book of Hebrews. This guy's making the point I was just making. You will see that some of the things from the temple are still existing in our church. As with the first covenant, we have regulations about our worship in the earthly sanctuary. The divine liturgy is celebrated in the same way across the entire planet. It has been for centuries. And we uh, have this facing east. I forgot about the facing east. That's something that uh, is common as well. Uh, the domes, the icon screens, etc. We have uh, the two tents, particularly the sanctuary where the lady gather, the narthex, and the nave. And we have lampstands, we have tables. The altar is the uh, the table of the Eucharistic altar. Only the priests and altar boys uh, can go behind the iconostasis to the table. Um, we have the incense. We have the tabernacle, which is uh, contains the new covenant, that is the body and blood of Christ. The, so for us, you know, if you look at a Jewish synagogue, you notice they have the Torah uh, in the, the little tabernacle thing. For us, it's the Eucharist that's in the tabernacle because we think we're participating in and eating the living Torah. We think that Jesus is the living Torah. Um, around the altar are the representations of the cherubim. The round discs are carried around in the procession. The altar, by the way, the round discs uh, are the fans, right? They represent the uh, angels participating in the liturgy. And if we, ju if you notice, we just saw in the book of Revelation, John was talking about the angels, the cherubim, and the liturgy in heaven. There are differences, however, between the worship then and now. So Protestants, keep in mind, because Protestants, oh, you're just a bunch of Judaizers, you're coming up with ceremony, traditions of men. No, 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 there's differences. So not everything carries over. There's differences. Messianic Jews. Hebrew roots. Cult. Okay? Not everything carries over. Some things don't carry over. There's some differences. The second tent, that is the halter, the, the altar, holy altar, is no longer covered by the curtain in the service. There is a curtain, but in the service, the liturgy, the curtain opens. That's because the veil is rent. So Protestant, well, the veil is rent. Well, it's no longer. No, no, no. The veil is rent in the service. During each service, the people then see into the Holy of Holies. That's why it opens. That's the meaning of the veil being rent for us. The priest no longer takes blood and offers it for himself and the heirs of the people. The priest takes bread and wine. What did Melchizedek bring out that we saw in Genesis 14? Bread and wine. And offers a bloodless sacrifice. The New Testament sacrifice is not a human sacrifice done over and over and over as Protestants think we're doing. In our liturgy, it's called a, our rational noetic worship. The gifts become the body and blood of Christ and they're offered to the people in order that we all may be cleansed of sin. So uh, I don't know who this is. This is just an article that came up. Uh, it's just a kind of a brief overview. It actually doesn't go into the the symbolism in depth but if you do want to read this little brief thing here it is and remember guys too uh lewis's video is a really well presented long version of that okay so if you want the full reference here's lewis's video on the continuity between the old and the new testament in terms of worship which is a crucial point not just for protestants guys but also for islam and how does it relate to Islam and Judaism? Well, this is the final clincher point we want to get to here for this whole talk. But you have to give me a second because my computer is about to die. So let me plug the computer in. I'll be right back.
also remember if you want to go deeper into the temper temple tabernacle stuff uh seraphim hamilton and i have done um i don't know like five different episodes together where we go pretty deep into a lot of that so uh, if you enjoy this discussion this topic uh definitely want to go check out the discussions that uh, seraphim hamilton and i did and you want to check out uh lewis's video here that i'm going to pull up Uh, that makes all these same points here. So let's see. So you'll notice like, uh, uh, well, here comes the ads. <laughs> that was actually a perfect uh, example of something that you wouldn't expect. So you'll notice Look at that Orthodox Bishop. Well, he just happens to look just like <laughs> example of the priest. Now there's some differences because, uh, there's some difference of influence, right? Not everything that, uh, Orthodoxy doesn't completely bear the stamp of, uh, the Hebrew tradition. It also has a, uh, influence from, uh, Byz Byzantium. So there's, there's a Byzantine stamp of influence as well as the Hebrew stamp of influence too throughout the history of the church, uh, but that's only natural for um, an institution that is primarily uh, Gentile, right? But coming out of its true Hebrew roots. <laughs> so we would say we're the real Hebrew roots movement, right? Not these crazy cults, but um, that's just one example, right? Let's see some other examples that... Uh... So uh, Lewis in this video does a great job of pointing out all kinds of uh, objects um, in the New Testament iconostasis here, he's using the fans that I mentioned, uh, which are um, angelic representations that go back to Exodus, the cherubim. Um, he gives the tabernacle, re uh, referencing the manna. Uh, you could reference the ark as well. Uh, let's see, what else did Lewis pick out in this video? Um, I'm just using a couple examples. Here's where he was showing uh, the synagogue and... The the uh, the Torah. So let's. So you'll notice here that in the synagogue, right up where the 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 holy place, you could say, in the synagogue is where the the, the tabernacle of the Torah, right, is put behind the the veil. And that for us that corresponds to there's the Orthodox liturgy, and you'll see that. The iconostasis, well, the altar would be up there, right? So here's the a, a, a parallel with the gospel being read like the Torah, you see. So let's see what else. Uh, antiphonal chanting, that's a liturgical element that I mentioned. Uh, we So a lot of this I've already covered. Um he goes into the Eucharist and a lot. This is a great uh, documentary, by the way. So I highly recommend. That says the, the blessings, right? Uh, Paul gives the blessings at the end. At the Orthodox Church at the end, you get the priest gives the blessings. So it's the same things. All of this stuff, again, and this is a key point that I wanted to get to in Lewis's video. <clears throat> okay. The notion of priesthood. Okay, uh, and this icon here is the icon that I chose for my uh, video as well. And it's the famous icon, Christ the High Priest. Because Christ the High Priest refutes the three opposition, the three opposing views in the title, right? Islam, Judaism, Protestantism. There is the royal priesthood of all Christians, which is a participation in the eternal Melchizedekian priesthood, 1 Peter 2, 9. Christ is the one who offers and is offered as a high priest, Hebrews 8, John 18, as the Lamb of God. Uh, this is a controversy in early Byzantium that I've covered many times. Sacramental priesthood typified in the bishop, Malachi 1, 11, Acts 1, 20, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and Malachi 1, incense will be offered all over the world to the name to the God of Israel how is that possible remember in Leviticus that we just saw 
You can't just up and do whatever you want. Oh, I'm going to start my own little worship service over here. Right? I'm a, I'm a Pacific Islander. I'm going to start my own little worship service because it says in Malachi that the na that far off nations, islands will worship the God of Israel. Oh, well, that's just doing whatever you want. No, you can't just do whatever you want. You can't just offer sacrifices and incense as you want. And yet Malachi says, right, incense will be offered all over the world to the God of Israel. How is that possible? It's not possible in the Aaronic system because incense can only be offered liturgically in the temple. And yet the prophecy says that it will be all over the world. And that's just one example, okay? There are so many prophecies throughout the minor prophets, right? Of all of these, all the nations... We've covered that many, many times over. Go watch my old videos. I'm not going to rehearse all that. Uh, of the uh, the Gentile nations worshiping the God of Israel. But we want to look at a couple here because of what they say in terms of liturgical worship. So this says Malachi 1. <clears throat> it's a, a section where it describes daily liturgical pri uh, priestly offerings. Okay, that's the context if you read Malachi 1. And we know this this famous messianic prophecies. Okay, so this is not we don't it's not like we don't know what Malachi is talking about. I mean, cited it multiple times in the New Testament about the coming Messiah. For as the rising of the sun to its going down, my name will be glorified amongst the Gentiles, and in every place incense will be offered to my name as a pure offering. My name will be great amongst the Gentiles. How is incense a liturgical offering that is only done according to Levitical law by the sons of Aaron? How is that going to be done by the Gentiles in all the nations? It seems impossible unless, oh, what do you know? Jesus is the fulfillment of this. And Protestants, we have a description of liturgical worship incense in the New Testament, in the Messianic era. This is a prediction of the church. But your churches, Protestants, don't have offerings and you don't have incense. How is this fulfilled in you? Anyway, Lewis goes on to describe the laying on of hands as a transferring of authority, which I covered earlier, the priesthood. Uh, and let's see what else it mentions new covenant priesthood all right that's enough I'm gonna get all these boomer ads going um get this off of here stand this woman's face I'm talking about butt cheeks get this out of here what the heck all right so this is a helpful graphic here again from Lewis I can barely see this so he says uh, Judaism, Islam, Protestantism, and then Orthodoxy being the apostolic, right? Questions of continuity, discontinuity, and conclusion. What about a hierarchical priesthood? Okay, Judaism, kind of, yeah. They would still argue for that. Uh, but what's a key point against the Jewish position here? Uh, where has the priestly offering been for the last 2,000 years? Now, I read Genesis 49, and Genesis 49 says that when Shiloh comes, one to whom the nations look, it says there won't be a house of David. So the removal of the Davidic throne is a sign the Messiah has come. Judah is a lion's whelp. 
from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, as a lion who will, who will rouse him, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. That is the kingly rule, nor the lawgiver until Shiloh comes, and to him will be the obedience of the nations. In other words, when you see the departure of the rulership of the house of David, when that's gone, then you'll know that Shiloh has come because the nations will look to him. Okay, that's the Messiah. What happened when Jesus came? Well, in 70 AD, the Jews lost the priesthood and the kingdom. There's no king ruling. There's no Aaronic priesthood. Where is it? Where has that been for so long? Oh, well, you see, there has been a priesthood. And there has been an offering to God's name amongst the Gentiles, Malachi 1.11. There has been an altar built, even in Egypt, in Syria, and all the places where were formerly God's enemies. Do you remember Isaiah? There will be an altar in Egypt to my name? How could there be an altar in Egypt? You understand that if we're Jews, you can't build altars. like You can't just do whatever you want. Okay. The altar can only be in Jerusalem. You can't build your own altar. Do, do you understand? This is not too difficult. <laughs> it's not that hard of an argument, right? Again, uh, I'm, I'm going to just assume that you guys can go watch the other videos that we've done countless times about how the church itself is a proof of uh, Christ as the Messiah, right? Because... One of the things that is said dozens of times over in the Old Testament is that when the Messiah comes, the Gentile nations will worship the God of Israel. And uh, what do you know? When Jesus came, that happened. And the Davidic lineage ends in the sense of a ruling king because we think Jesus is the final Davidic king, right? Right? And uh, when we, what do we read in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 19? Somehow it says, Egypt and Assyria will be together with Israel as God's people. What? How can Israel be together with Egypt and Assyria? One of the three, a blessing of the Lord. My people, Egypt. Blessed are my people Egypt. Blessed are my people Assyria. Blessed is Israel my inheritance. What? That's crazy. Unless, oh, yeah. There's an altar in Egypt to the Lord. As Isaiah 19 predicts. Now, the other text I wanted to get to, again, there are dozens of predictions of the Gentile church being a sign of the Messiah. That means that the last 2,000 years, church, is the fulfillment of that. There's only one that fits that, the Orthodox Catholic Church. What does Isaiah say at the end of Isaiah? This curious text. Gentile priests? How is that possible? And I'm also pointing this out because, uh, again, do you not see... Uh, Muslims, th none of this even makes any sense with what you're talking about. You don't have priests. You don't have an altar. You don't have what we're talking about here. I know their works and their thoughts. I will gather all the nations and tongues. They will come and see my glory. I will set a sign amongst them, amongst them those whom, uh, who escape. I will send them to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands, who have not heard about my fan. This is the gospel. The apostles going out preaching the gospel. They will declare my glory among the Gentiles. They will bring your brethren for an offering out of all the nations.
and I will take some of them for priests and Levites. What? People amongst the nations are being brought as an offering to the God of Israel. My glory amongst the Gentiles. And I will take some of them for priests and Levites. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, remember, there will be an offering of incense amongst the Gentiles to the God of Israel. There will be an altar in Egypt where Assyrians and Egyptians and Israel will all worship the same God. How can you have an altar in Egypt? And Gentile priests taken from amongst the nations to become priests. To the, that's not possible in the Jewish law. And Protestants. Where's your incense and your priesthood being offered that's offering to the God of Israel? It's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. Well, how come nobody understood it's all spiritual until Luther and Calvin and your guys, right? How, how come everybody took this to be a liturgical phenomenon for so many, so many uh, centuries, century after century, where we have hierarchical priesthood existing in Judaism and Orthodox Christianity, according to Lewis's graph here. Okay. Uh, does that exist in Islam? Absolutely not. Does it exist in Protestantism? Absolutely not. So who's in continuity between the Old Testament, what's in the Torah and the prophets, and then and the New Testament religion? Because remember, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, whatever comes that's new revelation, supposedly, has to be consistent with what came before. Okay, so we're looking for the things that carry over. We're told that priesthood is eternal we're told that there's an eternal everlasting israel there's an eternal sabbath there's an eternal priesthood an eternal offering an eternal covenant okay where is this because it's in it's got to be in continuity it's got to be in continuity with what the promise to abraham was as well who is the son of abraham truly well according to galatians it's jesus the one to whom all the nations look Where's the liturgical worship? Does Islam have it? Nope. Protestants? Uh, not really. So, again, commonality there. The idea of atoning sacrifice. Does that exist in Judaism? Yes. Islam? Absolutely not. Does it exist in Protestantism? Uh, not really, but it may be. Just the finished work of Jesus, friends. But no continuing notion of sacrifice, even though they turn around and admit there is a continuing notion of sacrifice. Give yourselves as living sacrifices to Jesus. Intercessory prayer is a sacrifice. Right. Do we have feast days? Not really. Islam, no. Judaism, yes. Orthodoxy, yes. And guess what? Helpful indicator here. Some of the same feast days. Pentecost. <laughs> Pentecost is in Judaism. Pentecost. It's in orthodoxy. Pascha, it's in Orthodoxy. Pascha, Passover in Judaism. There's helpful indicators there to tell you who's in continuity. Do Protestants or Muslims have that? No, they do not. The notion of uh, symbolic temples with imagery and a layout. Does that exist in Islam? No. Protestantism, mm, not really. Maybe Anglicanism a little bit. Does it exist in orthodoxy? Yes. The notion of divine eminence, Islam? No. God is not in the, this world. God is not imminent in Islam. Right? Yet the Old Testament says countless times over, Muslims, with the theophanies, which are pre signifiers of the incarnation. Again, you guys are just completely ignorant of what the Old Testament actually teaches. You think you're in continuity with it, and you're totally ignorant of what it actually teaches. Because there's countless instances of theophanies, which I've covered in countless live streams. So divine eminence, which is clearly taught in uh, the Old Testament and in the Law and the Prophets. Is it taught in Protestantism? Yeah, they, they teach it, but they don't believe in a real presence or anything like that. They're iconoclastic like Muslims. So not really. Um, restricted access in terms of laity and heterodox. Judaism, uh, maybe. I'm not sure why that's X'd out, but the idea exists from Judaism. But they don't have a temple, so maybe that's why Lewis put an X there. Um, Islam, and by the way, there's not a priesthood, right? I mean, 
Jews might argue that they can resurrect the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, maybe some kind of DNA stuff. I don't know, but <laughs> like we're arguing that the priesthood has always been there. You see, you see the point of this argument. Where's your priesthood? Protestantism. Um, no, doesn't really have that unless it's some kind of reformed church, maybe, uh, uh Orthodox Christianity. Yes. Ritual elements. Judaism retains it. Islam. I mean, I guess they have a couple rituals, right? But not really. Um, Protestants and eh, minimized. So again, uh, the principles here are pretty clear. <clears throat> so crux of the argument is Yeah, I think I covered all my notes. The only thing I didn't really get into was uh, what Jesus does in the Gospel of John in terms of arguing about continuity with the Pharisees, right? Because Jesus is consistently arguing that, you know, he worships the same God as the Old Testament, right? The Father, he's, he's in continuity with the worship of the Old Testament in that it's the same God and Father that gave the Jews the law. And in fact, key point in the New Testament, Jesus is who gave the law the mosaic law in our view so who's consistent well Let's take a look. Now, remember, in order to be in continuity with the Old Testament, you can't throw out the elements that are the key indicators of the covenant and the continuity. So we can't throw away all of these things and say, oh, I'm in continuity. Are you? How can you be if you don't have the priesthood or the high priest himself? Jesus, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. How can, how can you think you're in continuity without that when it's so fundamental to the Old Testament text? It's a very simple argument. So when we look at altar, priesthood, temple, holy site, liturgy, sacrifice, incense, holy water, as in holy washings, right does any of this exist in islam no it doesn't so you're not in continuity with the old testament that's the point so you're not the true inheritor of the old testament you are out of continuity only orthodox christianity is in continuity now the last point then about the uh uh, Roman Catholics that I wanted to mention was oh well you see aha Jay we, you can't prove this argument uh, functions in no way against the Roman Catholics because uh, you know they also have this idea of priesthood okay well that's true but what is a key uh, terminal flaw Well, the Vatican has opened up a common faith center. They support this. This is uh, Francis's common worship center thing that he got together with. Remember when he got together with the Grand Imam and they drew up this the document that God wills all the world religions document. And then that birthed the idea of the uh, Abrahamic Faith House Center that they're going to build, or they have, I don't know if they built it yet, to open in 2022. So I don't know if it's open yet or not, or op open yet or not. But uh, the article from the Vatican notes that when uh, old Frank met with the Grand Imam, they talked about their shared values. This, here's the hideous looking structure that they're building here. You know, so it's always looks like some sort of uh, space stuff, right? Like some nasty 
uh, ridiculous dystopian sci-fi novel. Whenever they build this uh, world religion crap, it's always like this ugly sci-fi looking stuff, right? So, and as you guys know, we've covered Nostra Aetate. We've covered the Vatican II uh, notion of uh, generic theism, natural theology, a thousand times over. Remember, their whole ethos, their whole thing with how they've taken natural theology is to mean, oh, well, we all have the... You believe in one God, I believe in one God, we all believe in the same God, which is actually a fallacy, right? I have one mother, you have one mother, we all have one mother. Is that true? No, it's an obvious fallacy. And I can't understand why Trent and all these people can't understand this, right? Just because you say one God does not mean that we all believe in the same God. Just like we all come from one mother doesn't mean we all come from the same mother. It's a really simple point. And yet, the whole absurdity of this, as if because all of these three religions call themselves Abrahamic, they're, they are therefore Abrahamic. No, they're not. I mean, has no one read Galatians? I, I'm baffled by this. Do you get to be a child of Abraham because you say, I worship the God of Abraham. No. Okay. That, that, that's not, that doesn't make the cut. What does Paul say in Galatians? This shouldn't even be up for debate. It's very bizarre to me that you know, so many Roman Catholics are making this ridiculous natural theology argument. Are you a child of Abraham simply because you say, I worship the God of Abraham? Uh, no, because who are the children of Abraham? Who does Paul say? Brethren, I speak to you in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, if it be confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed, the promises were made. Who is Abraham's seed? According to Paul, it's Jesus. So if you don't have Jesus, you don't have his seed. You're not, you're not one of Abraham's seed. That's the whole point of Galatians. The whole point of this chapter is to say that you're not Abraham's seed by being merely externally circumcised or biological descent or by just saying, oh, I'm Abraham's, I'm Abraham's seed or by following the religion of Hagar. <laughs> None of those things make you that. According to Paul's argument, and I'm saying this to the Roman Catholics because the Roman Catholics are the ones saying that we're all monotheists because so we all have the same Abrahamic faith. No, we don't. The only people who have the Abrahamic faith are those who follow Christ. That's it. No one comes to the Father by but by me. Did Jesus say, oh, but unless you're a follower of Muhammad, then you can still get to the Father because you believe in one God. No. The one God, the Father, is only accessed by the high priest of the covenant, the Son of God. There you go. So all of this is canceled out in the Roman Catholic view by their stupid argumentation and acceptance of the ridiculous natural theology idea that because we all have a monotheistic faith, that therefore we all worship the same God. It's ridiculous. It's completely stupid. And Paul's whole argument hinges on the fact that you only have access to the one father through the son. For you are all sons of God, the father through Jesus. No, there's no other way. In Jesus, there's not Jew or Greek or whatever. If you are Christ's, then you're Abraham's seed. There is no generic monotheism that makes you Abraham's seed. There is no such thing as an Abrahamic faith house of the world religions. But in the Pope's program, there is. And that tells you that that religion is false. That alone should tell you that religion is false. All right, let's get to the super chats. Hopefully everybody sees the point here. It's not a very super hard argument. Maybe I should also bring in... Um,
the talks that we did about, uh, I think that was with Sam Shamoon. Maybe I need to bring in the, um, just go watch the old talks with Sam Shamoon because we get into the uh, prophecies of the Gentile church in that, uh, which is what the last 2000 years is, guys. Joshua L. Sunza, $5. Can you talk about the church fathers? Who were they? I mean, bro, I've got years of lectures on that. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm just saying, yeah, of course I can talk. I mean, <laughs> we've talked about it for a long time. Uh, I mean, we've lectured through but Basil's works. We've, we've lectured through uh, multiple Athanasius works. We've lectured through John Damascus's works. We've lectured, I mean, we lectured through a lot of these. So um, just get into the archive, man. I don't know what else to say. What was the criteria to be considered a church father? Well, there's patristic writers and then there's saints. So a lot of people are, you know, ancient witnesses. Tertullian could be called a, a quote, church father, maybe, but he ended up a heretic. Uh, so, you know, the Orthodox Church doesn't think everybody from the ancient period is a, is a saint. So t uh, typically or traditionally speaking, a father is one who... Uh, should be a person who is a saint and saw the light you could say frankie d five dollars i was talking to a guy recently about predestination calvinist doctrines irresistible grace <laughs> premillennialism that's not calvinist but some calvinists might believe in it i was trying to explain the church fathers condemned this as a heresy he was insisted that church fathers such as augustine preached it uh no this, this person is completely ignorant. Uh, Augustine did not teach premillennialism. In fact, premillennialism is only taught by a couple of the post-apostolic fathers unless they are speaking spiritually. Uh, and it is condemned at Constantinople 1. Frankie D, $5. Would your refutations of these doctrines fall more generally under Calvinism? Well, most Calvinists aren't premillennialists. So most Calvinists are amillennialists or postmillennialists. So that really, the eschatology doesn't really factor into it. Um, but uh, again, we've done multiple. Go watch my talks on Calvinism. I've done probably five. Uh, Brian McDankington. Sorry if this has been asked a million times. What is your view of Toll Houses? Uh, I've been promoting uh, Father Seraphim Rose's book for many years. Nectaria, fifty dollars. Uh, tonight's stream was very illuminating. Illuminating. Uh, thank you very much, Nectaria. Hope you appreciate that, or I appreciate that. Hope you uh, derived a lot of insight. And um, you know, th this is the apologetics of the Book of Hebrews. So actually, you know, I'm not really presenting anything new. I'm just kind of restating what's in Hebrews, but I'm applying it to the heresy of Protestantism, the heresy of Islam and the unbelief of Judaism. So that's the application here. Thank you for that. King Danny, $3. Anthony Rogers tried to say apostolic churches offer strange fire. Well, yeah, but he's a heretic outside the church. So he's going to think that whoever disagrees with him offers strange fire. So what? Uh, he can't prove sola fide in the reformed understanding in the early church. Well, yeah, because sola fide presupposes a fixed canon and the canon isn't fixed until centuries after the apostles. Liam, $5. When Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will not pass away. Was he talking about the destruction of the temple? Yes. Um, it's also talking about the end of the world. It's both. Conscious 777. I appreciate your work, Jay. Well, thank you so much, Conscious 777. Uh, remember, guys, there's still uh, tickets at the Orlando event September 3rd. You can get those uh, in the link in the show description. Also, if you want to uh, support me, the best way to do that is to buy the books and the, the works at the website, right? My big fat book, almost 700 pages of all the theology essays. Um, the Meta Narratives book is out, the new, the new little book on philosophy. And also, guys, I want to remind you, too, to support the show by going to Chalk.com, which is our show sponsor. They offer the best, uh, better than organic supplements that are out there on the market. Uh, they are 100% rainforest source. They are uh, stringent in terms of their purification process. Uh, the Tonkat Ali, for example, is shown in multiple studies to, via peer review, boost testosterone. Uh, the Irish Moss, great for balancing out your hormones if you're one of the ladies. 
Uh, she legit great for mental focus and clarity. G Jamie takes that every day, literally. Uh, there's also the daily, which is great for overall supplementation. If you're just looking for a boost energy when you're getting in the gym, Action 2.0. Um, what else? They've got all kinds of great stuff. Um, ashwagandha, right? A lot of people into the ashwagandha, especially in the uh, carnivore keto. Also like the Sheila Jet as well. Uh, so again, head on over to chalk.com, chalk.com. Pull this up for you guys so you guys see what I'm talking about. Uh, great stuff over there. And you'll notice um, they have the stacks. And what stacks are is a way for you to kind of pick out what the best supplements are for men, for women. There's a women's stack, a men's stack, and they also have recurring subscriptions. So when you go over here, if you want to pick the male vitality stack, for example, you want to add that to your cart and then uh, you want to use the promo code, right? So they have the off option for uh, putting in the uh, coupon. Coupon codes here, uh, the, co the coupon code for recurring subscriptions is J53LIFE. That's J53LIFE. And that will give you uh, a little bit of a bigger discount, especially on the recurring subscriptions. Um, but you don't have to do recurring subscriptions. You can also just buy a stack, for example, check it out. You don't have to buy a whole stack. You can also buy individual products. If you just want to test it out, use the promo code J50. That's J-A-Y-5-0 to get 50% off. Again, chalk.com, great company. Um, they've, they've organized the stacks for men, stacks for women just makes it easier for you to pick out what you need again male vitality female vitality right there there's the um as you say as you can see ashwagandha she legit iris moss the stuff that i said jamie's been t testing out she loves it we love chalk uh, we have a lot of free uh chalk giveaways at the orlando event so if you want to come to that you'll get hundreds of dollars of free supplements there as well if you're coming to the orlando event um do not use uh, Tristan's code. That is uh, not allowed. You can't use Tristan's code. You have to use my code, not Tristan's code. Tristan's code will actually give you an error message and probably uh, infect your computer with spyware. So if you're looking for that blue screen of death, if you're looking for um, you know uh, weird gamer pop-ups that will always pop up, then you want to use Tristan's code. If you're looking for actual health supplementation, use my promo codes, J five zero or j53 life all right thank you guys uh, everybody have a good night and hopefully you enjoyed this send this to your muslim friends or your protestant friends and uh